Hello and welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, hi, you are very welcome. This is Reading the Past and I'm Dr Cat. A few weeks ago, I made a video on Reginald Pohl. Beneath that video, I was asked whether Pohl had perhaps considered altering his actions, maybe handing himself over to the Henrician authorities as a means of protecting, even saving his family members. And I've also been asked, beneath my video on Margaret Pohl, and I will leave both those videos linked, whether or not she was perhaps framed. And so today, it feels appropriate for us to take a look at the Exeter conspiracy and its fallout, including the downfall of the Pohl family. Was it the case, as some have suggested, that this Exeter plot was significantly overblown in the reporting of it? as a way of bringing down a number of powerful individuals around the king and at court. Could it have been that Reginald Pohl's public opposition to Henry VIII was the main, or even the sole reason, that members of his family were targeted in this way? Was this a frame-up? Or were true traitors discovered and punished? And so now, let's take a look at the Exeter conspiracy and all of those that it destroyed. Towards the beginning of my video on Reginald Pohl, I did go through his family's royal blood and their claim to the throne. Indeed, I did set up the family tree that showed those things and I put that on screen. As I mentioned, I will leave my video on Pohl linked, so if you want to check that out, you can go back and do so. But by way of a quick reminder, Reginald Pohl's mother, Margaret Pohl, was the daughter of George, Duke of Clarence. George, Duke of Clarence, was brother to kings Edward IV and Richard III. Margaret's mother was Isabel Neville, and she was the eldest daughter of Warwick the Kingmaker. Following the execution of her brother, Edward, Earl of Warwick, in 1499, Margaret Pole, according to some at least, represented the last true Plantagenet. The plot that brought her and much of her family down was, though, named after another notable person another individual who could also lay claim to having royal blood. He was Henry Courtney, Marquis of Exeter. His mother was Catherine, the sixth daughter of King Edward IV and Elizabeth Woodville, and this made Catherine the sister of King Henry VIII's mother, Elizabeth of York, and also the first cousin of Margaret Pole too. During the reign of King Henry VIII, it was said that Henry Courtney was, quote, the king's near kinsman, and hath been brought up of a child with his grace in his chamber. The Courtney and Pole families were thus kin to each other and to the King of England. Blood ties with the monarch were not, however, any guarantee of safety. As Henry VIII's first cousin once removed, Edward Stafford, 3rd Duke of Buckingham, would discover to his very great cost. Buckingham was executed for treason in 1521. At the time of his arrest, Margaret Pole's eldest son, Henry Pole, also fell under suspicion. Indeed, he would be in prison for a short time too. Nevertheless, he would soon be back in a place of trust and favour with his king, or at least he would be for a time. The Poles and the Courtenays had been central figures at a variety of royal courts, and the court of Henry VIII was no different. They had been there from the very start of his reign. Henry Courtney's wife, Gertrude, like Margaret Pole, would become a close friend and supporter of Catherine of Aragon. And so perhaps unsurprisingly, these ladies, and those they surrounded themselves with, had not celebrated the elevation of Anne Boleyn to become Queen of England. Instead, they remained vocal in their support of Catherine as Henry's true wife and Mary as his true heir. They became part of a so-called Aragonese faction at court, and this group included a number of high-profile courtiers, who, in addition to supporting Catherine and Mary, were also, for the most part, more conservative in matters of faith. There were suggestions that Margaret Pole had become involved with Elizabeth Barton, who some knew as the Holy Maid of Kent. This holy maid had offered damning prophecies about what might befall King Henry VIII if he persisted in his great matter and married Anne Boleyn. I have made a video on Barton that I will leave linked. 
While Margaret Pohl's involvement was only suspected, Gertrude Courtney, it was found, had gone in disguise to meet with Barton, and she had then hosted her at the Courtney home. These stances, these activities, put these individuals in opposition with Thomas Cromwell, or at least they did, until it came time to bring down Anne Boleyn in May 1536. It seems very much like the old adage rings true, that the enemy of my enemy is my friend, or at least they are while it's useful, and for a time. Many in the Aragonese faction seem to have hoped that the events of May 1536 would be the thing that saw Mary finally recognised once again as being legitimate, and also the thing that would cause the church to be returned to its former state. Within weeks, though, following an increase in the pressure on and the threat towards Mary and her friends, the king's daughter was compelled to capitulate, to acknowledge her father's act of supremacy and the nullity of her parents' marriage. King Henry VIII, no doubt still chafing from the criticism that came from this Aragonese faction over his great matter and royal supremacy, would have further cause for concern towards the end of 1536. At that time, an uprising which would come to be known as the Pilgrimage of Grace broke out. A few months before this, Reginald Pohl, in self-imposed exile on the continent, completed his defence of the unity of the church and chose to send Henry VIII a copy of it. In this text, he wrote of his absolute opposition to the royal supremacy. He also hinted at the rightness, the justification for an uprising against it among Henry's nobles. There had seemingly been plans for Margaret Pole to be returned to court and rehabilitated, all of which were promptly stalled by the arrival of her son's missive at King Henry VIII's court. Margaret was informed of her son's behaviour by an, I'm sure, enraged King Henry. Margaret promptly sent her son a letter that she no doubt expected that Henry and his advisers would read, and in that letter she remonstrated with Reginald Pole for his, quote, folly. Considering what Reginald had suggested might be an appropriate response to Henry's behaviour on the part of Henry's nobles, I do have to wonder if Henry might have found that word folly rather mild. At the end of 1536, the Pope made Reginald Pole a cardinal, and then after that he was made a legate. There were members of Pole's family who wrote to him encouraging him not to accept this post. Evidently, he did not take their advice. As part of Pole's legantine mission, he was privately tasked with supporting, arguably inflaming, those who had risen up in the name of, as they saw it, the true faith. These were the so-called pilgrims of the Pilgrimage of Grace. Meanwhile, Reginald's brothers, Henry and Geoffrey, were given a chance to prove their loyalty to the Henrician regime by leading their troops against the Pilgrimage of Grace. An identical show of loyalty was also expected from Henry Courtney. He had been accused, in the aftermath of the fall of Anne Boleyn, of wanting Mary to be viewed as her father's heir and successor, despite there being a legal prohibition against him doing so. Another prominent courtier, who also had Aragonese faction sympathies, was Nicholas Carew. He was accused alongside Henry Courtney at this time, and like Courtney, he was also summoned to help put down the Pilgrimage of Grace. Henry Pohl, Henry Courtney, his wife Gertrude Courtney and Nicholas Carew would be sufficiently rehabilitated for them to feature prominently in the great ceremonies of the royal court not long afterwards. They were, for example, at the baptism of Prince Edward on the 15th of October 1537 and they did play named roles. Henry Pohl uncovered the basin Henry Courtney served as an attendant, Gertrude Courtney was tasked with carrying Edward, and Nicholas Carew was one of three men put in charge of the font. And then, at Jane Seymour's funeral the following month, Henry Pole attended Mary, the king's daughter. She was the chief mourner. Nicholas Carew's wife, Elizabeth, who was the sister of Francis Bryan, also known as the Vicar of Hell, about whom I have made a video that I will leave linked, was also in attendance at the funeral. If any members of this Aragonese faction began to feel confident that they had managed to weather the earlier storm, if they had hope 
that from their place of nascent rehabilitation, they might be able to work on Henry to change the path their nation was taking, they would soon be extraordinarily disappointed. Geoffrey Pole, who had not been welcomed back into the fold of royal favour in 1537, soon became concerned that his support for certain conservative religious figures had been discovered and that it might in turn be cast as evidence that he was in some way a criminal. He sought advice, even protection, from Thomas Cromwell. Geoffrey was put in the Tower of London on the 29th of August, 1538. Around two months later, on the 26th of October, his interrogations began. His communications with his brother Reginald Pole were explored. Before long, the questioning moved to discuss the plans of his other brother, Henry Pole. Imprisonment and suspicion were, it seems, hard on Geoffrey. As T.F. Mayer points out, Geoffrey would attempt to take his own life on two occasions. Mayer also states that Geoffrey's confession was signed, quote, in a state of collapse. In the early days of November 1538, Geoffrey was joined in the Tower by his brother Henry Pole, by Henry Courtney, Gertrude Courtney, and their son Edward Courtney, along with others who were suspected of being involved in their plotting against King Henry VIII and his England. The accusations against this group were fairly broad. They were variously said to be conspiring with Reginald Pole. It was said they wished to serve Mary and not the King, that they were seeking to overthrow King Henry VIII in Henry Courtney's favour, and possibly with the support of the Emperor Charles V and Francis I, who were themselves apparently considering an invasion of England that might deal with the perceived heresy that was occurring there. It was also alleged that the individuals involved in this plot wished to subvert the royal supremacy. I mean, after all, had Gertrude Courtney not had well-known dealings with Elizabeth Barton? I mean, certainly those dealings would be brought up and Gertrude would seek desperately for forgiveness from the king on account of them. It was alleged that incriminating correspondence had been burned on the orders of Henry Pole who was also accused of complaining that all of the honest men were being removed from court. It was also said that he had imagined the king's death. It was alleged that another within this faction, Sir Edward Neville, who was also a kinsman to the Poles and the Courtenays, had taken to dabbling in prophecy, presumably in such a way that it was considered dangerous to the king's person. On the 12th of November, Margaret Pole's own interrogation began. At first, she was not sent to the Tower of London, but was instead kept in custody at Cowdray, the home of one of her interrogators, William Fitzwilliam, Earl of Southampton. Hazel Pearce describes her as being, quote, innocent of any treasonous activity. This would not be enough to save her in the end. Henry Pole, Henry Courtney and Edward Neville would all in time be convicted of treason. Courtney and Neville were beheaded on the 9th of December, 1538. Henry Pole met the headsman a month later, on the 9th of January, 1539. His brother Geoffrey had been pardoned a week earlier, on the 2nd of January, 1539. Gertrude Courtney and her son Edward Courtney were to remain in the Tower, while Margaret Pole was kept at Cowdray. On the 31st of December, 1538, Nicholas Carew was arrested and taken to the Tower of London. This was following the discovery of a letter that had been found at the Courtney home. This letter seemingly implicated Carew in their treason too. He would be tried and found guilty on the 14th of February 1539 and was then beheaded less than a month later on the 8th of March. In the Parliament of 1539, the executed men and their co-accused were attainted for their, quote, abominable treason. Also attainted at this time were Gertrude Courtney, Reginald Pole and Margaret Pole. Among other things, this act deprived these individuals and their heirs of their inheritances, all of which were now forfeit to the Crown. In time, Gertrude Courtney would be released, as would her son Edward, although it would take until 1553 for him. Meanwhile, Reginald Pole would remain unharmed as he stayed on the continent. The same was not the case for Margaret Pole. 
By November 1539, this now attainted woman had been moved to the Tower of London. Hazel Pierce explains how, quote, in order to facilitate the endorsement of her attainder in the Lords, Cromwell produced a tunic allegedly found in one of her coffers, which symbolised Reginald Pole's intention to marry Mary and restore papal authority to England. In all likelihood, this tunic was fabricated by Cromwell, as Warblington and the Countess's coffers had been thoroughly searched at her arrest in November 1538, and it is hard to believe that it did not come to light until six months later. Margaret Pole was held in the Tower of London until the 27th of May 1541. During this period of her imprisonment, she was housed as befitted her high birth. She was well fed, provided with waiting women and also with new clothes that had been made by the Queen's own tailor. And all of this happened at King Henry VIII's expense. Indeed, substantial expenditure on clothing for her had been made in the March of 1541. And this does make it all the stranger that just two months later, on the 27th of May, 1541, Margaret Pole was escorted to a scaffold built for the purpose within the Tower of London, and upon it she was executed in a botched beheading. Thus, the uncovering of the so-called Exeter Conspiracy led to the destruction of numerous prominent courtiers, a number of whom could claim to have a rather large dose of royal blood. And so many historians do see this whole event as nothing more than a massive fit-up. For many of the deaths, Thomas Cromwell is positioned as being a kind of key puppet master. Howard Leithhead asserts that once it, quote, became evident that the conservative faction was becoming a stronger and more cohesive force, Cromwell, perceiving the threat, again lashed out at his opponents at court. Leithhead's use of again here is a reference to his belief that Cromwell was instrumental in the downfall of Anne Boleyn and her faction just a few years previously. With regard to the fall of Nicholas Carew, Stanford Lemberg writes that it is, quote, probable that Thomas Cromwell, already fighting to preserve his own position, saw Carew as an enemy and wished him out of the way. Was this flurry of executions truly motivated by Thomas Cromwell's desire, even need, to figuratively clean house as a way to protect himself and or to allow himself the space to implement those policies that he deemed to be best with less opposition to them. Others point to King Henry VIII's increasing hatred of Reginald Pole, of his frustration that he could not get at Pole personally as being something that motivated this king to move against Pole's kith and kin. In particular, it is said that this hatred is what motivated the execution of Margaret Pole. Of course, perhaps the focus on Henry's motivations for this one might be explained by the fact that Cromwell can't get the blame for Margaret Pole's execution as he had been executed around 10 months before it happened, on the 28th of July, 1540. Perhaps, however, Henry was instead pushed into this act by some other factors. Could that unrest in the north of England that occurred towards the start of 1541 have rattled Henry? Did rumours of potential plots to break Margaret Pole out of the Tower play a part instead, or perhaps as well? Did Henry VIII want all of these people, members of his own family, out of the way because he was simply vengeful? Or did he perceive them to be a true threat to his rule, and possibly to the future rule of his son, Edward? Was he looking for any reason to cull the individuals with the claims of royal blood so that he might stabilise the succession of his son? After all, I think that Henry VIII must have been aware, at least on some level, that it was likely that his son Edward would be taking the throne as a child. Did Henry set Cromwell off against his enemies? Or did Cromwell incite some fear in the king so that he could remove those who had made life difficult or indeed dangerous for him? Or is it possible that some, maybe all of those who were caught up in this purge, were, at least on some level, guilty as charged? So what do you think of the extra conspiracy, of the guilt or otherwise of those who were accused? If they were framed, who do you think might have been responsible for that? Thomas Cromwell, King Henry VIII, or perhaps some combination of the two?
As always, I'm looking forward to reading your conversations in the comments section underneath this video. But I would also love it if you could pop an emoji or a social glyph in the comments too, because that will boost the engagement and the more engagement video gets, the more YouTube shares it out, which in turn will help us to grow this community. In terms of an emoji, this does feel like a risky one because I'm not sure that a whole series of emoji axes will keep the YouTube pixies particularly happy. In fact, it might make them a little bit anxious. So maybe we think of something royal, maybe some crowns, some kings and queens, or as a lot of people were imprisoned and indeed executed in the tower, maybe something castly could be a good emoji. You can find me elsewhere on social media. I will leave links to the other place you can find me on the internet in my description box. Please do follow me over on some of all of those so that we can continue this conversation and start some others. I do hope that you enjoyed this video and found it useful. If you did, why not share it with your friends? And if you like the channel, let some pals know about it. You can tell me you like this video in particular by hitting the thumbs up. Please do subscribe to the channel and if you think you are subscribed, have a check now to make sure that YouTube hasn't mysteriously unsubscribed you against your will. While you are there, checking, subscribing, maybe resubscribing, please do hit the bell icon that sits beside the subscribe button and then select all in the drop down that will appear. And that way, YouTube claims. They will tell you when I've next uploaded, but also when I am next planning to go live, which I do to talk about the history news, and I know you will not want to miss that. Of course, we have now got our failsafe. Please head over to my website, www.katrinamarchant.com. I will link it. And as you can see on screen, here is what you do. Go to the contact page, and then you will see on the contact page a little box. Put your email address in that box, and you will then be added to my mailing list. I will send you an email once a week with all of the news about what I'm up to and some useful links that you might want to have. I hope you're going to have a great day, whatever you're doing, and I look forward to speaking to you all in my next video. Take care of yourselves. Bye-bye for now.